We believe that as beautiful as the Irish arts and the Irish traditions are, that they are not meant to be put in a glass case. They're not meant to stay still. They are energy. They are moving. They are evolving. And they're coming through with people and with talent and with voices. And they cross through our path and we let them cross and we let them be what they are. That was Natalie Nugent O'Shea of the Celtic Junction Arts Center in Minnesota. And my name is Mark Nutty. And I'm John Lee. Welcome to the conversation for the Global Irish Nation here on Irish Stew. This episode of Irish Stew is sponsored by the Irish Heritage Tree Program. Celebrate your Irish roots by planting native trees for family and friends in the beautiful Golden Vale of Ireland. Go to irishheritagetree.com and use the exclusive discount code today. It's Irish Stew 10 for 10% off. That code again is Irish Stew and the numeral 10. Keep the heritage of Ireland green and growing by going to irishheritagetree.com. Those were the haunting sounds of loons. And the loon is the state bird of Minnesota. And when we think of the Irish in America, we usually think cities. We think Philadelphia, we think Boston, we think New York, we think Chicago. We rarely think of Minnesota. And so I'm delighted that we have a guest from Minnesota. So John, fill us in a little bit. Yes, our guest is uh, Natalie Nugent O'Shea, who is really putting uh, Ireland on the map in Minnesota as the, uh, I, and I'm only going to give you like one quarter of her credentials here, otherwise we take up the whole show. She's the executive director of the Celtic Junction Art Center, the Irish Cultural Center of Minnesota, that she operates with her team, the O'Shea Irish Dance School and Company, member of all the key Irish groups. Natalie, welcome to Irish Stew. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Martin. We had a chance to talk a little bit about Irish culture and a global footprint. And I'm going to take you back to 1994. And there was a eight minute performance aired in the Eurovision Song Contest held in Dublin that year. And I can't think of another eight minutes that so expanded the footprint of Irish arts globally, so changed the image of the Irish brand. And though you didn't know it at the time, it changed the trajectory of your own life. What does river dance mean to you? And what did it mean to expanding Irish culture globally? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, to me, um, my life as it is at the moment, um, perhaps my home in Minnesota, certainly my own children wouldn't actually exist without river dance. Um, it was a worldwide phenomenon, but it's actually touched so many lives, including mine, um, as it swept us up in its current uh, I was hired just for a two week moonlighting gig at the Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis, which I actually later found out used to be owned by Bob Dylan. There's a little gem for you. <laughs> uh, I was only to go, go two weeks um, and they laughed. They said, you know, you're another highly overqualified person to to come in and do a short time gig with us. And as I watched it, I was I was amazed because what I knew of Irish culture was actually fairly surface. I'm a classic American um, descendant, you know, goes back for five generations. I can tell you a little bit, but not a whole lot. I was raised on corned beef and cabbage, <laughs> St. Patrick's Day, and that was pretty much it. And here I was faced with this incredibly deep, powerful, even primal um, set of music set of dance and this mythological story that really, you know, wove through that that couple hour period. And I thought, oh, that, yeah, that was great. I'll have my check, please. <laughs> um, it didn't transform me right away um, until I ended up later meeting my husband um, that same evening. And I didn't know at the time um, he walked into the room, but uh, 
besides that brief period, we didn't meet for another year and a half. I ended up touring with Riverdance um, in one of their companies that went across Europe, Australia, uh, Japan, Scandinavia, while he was in the American mm. show. And we didn't meet up for some time later, but uh, it's really what's born a, a deep connection for me as an Irish American. Um, and then also has, has born my children. My daughter would have been in utero, you know, and heard the show a couple hundred times. Mm. Um, they wouldn't, they literally wouldn't exist, but for Riverdance, the show. And I'm sure that is the sense for, a, I'd say about 125 different Riverdance babies. There was a 25th anniversary <laughs> of Riverdance just past uh, February, 2020. We all reconvened at the Point Theater in Dublin, which is now the O3 uh, Arena, I think is what it's called, and met up with John McColgan, met up with Julian Erskine, and actually celebrated this phenomenon 25 years later with all the lives that had originally kicked it off, many of which that original lineup had actually been taught by my husband's mother and father as part of School Rinke Hey. So... It connected me to this really incredibly long line of traditional Irish dance and music and history and set me on an entirely different course. Natalie, going back to that first eight minute phenomenal uh, Eurovision, your, your husband was was part of that original performance, was he not? My husband was part of the original Eurovision performance, uh, part of the original cast of Riverdance at the Point Theatre and again at Hammersmith in Dublin. Uh, we ended up touring together for three years, um, including my lovely little daughter who was in utero for some of that time period. And that's part of what launched our future careers. So let's just uh, spin the dial back before the whole Riverdance thing. Um, you have an Irish name. Nugent. Um, and so I'm kind of curious. Uh, you started off, or from what I understand, you got a degree in theater, etc. Uh, in Minnesota. But tell us a little bit, of, you know, about what led you, led you to that place uh, where you kind of cross paths with um, Riverdance. Uh, wow. Well, um Yes, I, my background is theater. I was heading off into the world uh, directing. I actually started a lot of design work as well. Um, I've been doing work off and off off Broadway in New York, um, did some pieces in London. And then I was back home for a period of time when I actually I got a call at the Minnesota Opera Company uh, where, where I was working. And they said they just needed somebody to come in and moonlight. So the irony is that it is actually... Um, complete happenstance that I was drawn into this world. It wasn't any kind of a cultural basis at all. It was really just through my work. Uh, they caught me up in their current and, and like many other, you know, amazingly talented and capable people um, added us to their roster and took us around the world. And I ended up touring three years with Riverdance and uh, eventually my husband and I with our little uh, daughter, settled in Dublin to go make a normal life, um, or so we thought. Uh, but Ireland had other plans for us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's interesting because you kind of lived in both places, which is kind of really helpful for the kind of conversations that we try to have on this podcast. Well, I, I do have a unique perspective. I, I thought I would be living the rest of my my life in Ireland. Um, so I was an expat and now I'm an ex expat and not unlike um, Dorothy Gale and the Wizard of Oz, I think I had to go through this extraordinary journey to realize how special home is and what is actually here. And now I cannot imagine myself any place else. It's, it's, it's really quite special. Yeah, I think a lot of times, and you'll see that a lot in the Irish arts, uh, some of the greatest literature produced about Ireland is written by expats looking back at home. So you think of Joyce working in, uh, you know, what is now Croatia and Paris. Uh, you think of uh, Samuel Beckett, uh, you know, working also in Paris. Think of G.B. Shaw, you know, working in England and on and on and on. Um, but um, 
so your viewpoint um, obviously changed a lot about your home place, but let's talk a little bit about the home place. From what I understand, Minnesota's got something like about 5.7 million, 5.8 million people, which is kind of pretty much similar to Ireland. It's not too different, absolutely. Yeah, but it's a lot bigger. And then, you know, what fascinated me is that I believe somewhere around 10% of the population claim Irish ancestry. Like when I think of Minnesota, I think of, you know, uh, Scandinavian uh, folks. You know, you always hear about, you know, uh, Norwegian or Swedes, or etc. I don't think Irish. Um, so based on your Dublin experience, your husband, etc., I'm guessing you probably started probing that a little bit more. Well, I, I absolutely did. And and it's with great humility that, you know, I've great, I have a great deal more to learn. I would love to defer this question to my librarian, who actually really is who brings the richness of this Minnesota history into our center. But what I can tell you is this. Um, it came through the river. And so I, I find that the, the idea of, you know, whether you're thinking the River Dance or the Mississippi River here, it's really the current that's that's carried so much of this influence through. The Irish came initially as soldiers. They would have settled up in the Fort Snelling area. Um, a lot of them then came following it to be loggers. That's one of my librarian's specialties. He actually researches a lot of the Minnesota logging traditions. Um, they were almost all Irish. Yes, there were some Swedes thrown in. As a matter of fact, there's some great jokes, I'm sure, um, that we could unearth there. And some of the things that we know about the logging camps actually come through the oral histories. You know, the incredible strength of Ireland is its storytelling experience, is it's the way it captures the art. So if you can picture this little logging cabin in the middle of these beautiful pine woods and that there's this, you know, cachet of gentlemen and one of them might be playing tune and then another couple might sing a couple songs. They would actually become their own entertainment. And that's how a lot of these um, logging camps existed. And some of what's been passed down are the songs and the stories and the tunes that they would have have done. And that's that's part of what we're actually collecting is part of our uh, really special uh, Minnesota history, oral history and archives, which you don't realize what what special gems there are. There's a particular song I, I would actually mention that came over from Ireland into Wisconsin and Minnesota through these folks. And it tells the story of this young woman seeking for her man who would have been in the logging camps and would have done, you know, the logging down the rivers. And as most Irish stories have it, of course, it ends in tragedy. He's drowned um, bringing the logs down the river. And she, of course, gnashes her teeth and tears out her hair and says, you know, um, cast me into the river so I could go um, be with him. And as they find this song and the story, all of this, this incredible art and history was lost to Ireland. That original story came over here and it survived in the wilderness of Minnesota, where it was lost to its own homeland. And that's one of the really special things that happens. You know, we may not be uh, Appalachia, but those stories are here as well. And that's one of the many samples. And then when we, there's always the story of, too, when the Irish art, when any arts and culture comes to the United States, they start running into other cultures. And there starts to be, you know, kind of an energy and a tension between the various, you know, the Irish and the Swedes. I'm sure something new emerges from that. They find differences and they find similarities. Uh, you, t you, t you were telling me earlier a, a great uh, aspect of Irish history in uh, Minnesota, in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, the Connemara Patch. And, and Connemara is one of my favorite areas of Ireland. So I, I respond to that. What, what was the Connemara Patch and where does it figure into the Irish history in your part of your neck of the woods? Well, you know, again, it's, it's with humility that I tell the story. There are, there's this story and there's so many more like it. Um, the reason this one sticks is because it ended in tragedy. Um, there were actually some schemes as with the, um, the Tukes, as you could find um, in some research that ended really successfully. But the Connemara patch, as it happens, Father Nugent, uh, my middle name, was one who worked with Archbishop John Ireland here. Uh, and James J. Hill, who was the great railroad magnate. And they established a uh, 
Catholic colonization scheme. So they had all these lands that ran up along the railroad tracks, um, some of which they owned. So, you know, the, the purpose uh, for their colonization to those particular lands, you know, could be drawn with some question. Uh, but their purpose that they announced, of course, was to give uh, the people of Ireland, especially those suffering from the famine, especially in that far west coast, to give them a new home, new opportunity, new lands. They brought this group of people over from Connemara. They were actually an Irish speaking group, so they had no English. They shipped over. Of course, not everybody made it. Uh, they got onto the trains. They were brought into St. Paul. And I think some of them thought, OK, you know, we could work this out. But they weren't allowed to stay in St. Paul. They were actually put on another train and sent up to a little town called Graceville, way up into the prairies of Minnesota. They were given each a shack, um, some tools, some seeds, and either a livestock uh, or two, a pig or a cow. And were expected to go be hardy pioneers and go you know, work the land and do their thing. Um, but there's quite a lot of controversy. They came later than expected. Um, they had a difficult year. A lot of them weren't farmers. They didn't know how to plant. Um, they had been fishermen. They ate some of the seed um, or, or consumed it in other ways, ground it up for meal. They um, killed the livestock rather than breeding them. And then they were hit by um, the, the 1881, the classic, the long winter um, which was a hundred year blizzard that came, I believe it was October 18th, 1881. Mm. And the Native Americans had actually warned a lot of the community about this. They had a sense by the behavior of the animals, the things were coming, that the Connemaras, you know, had no communication with people, no way to know. And they were frozen in this prairie land. And I can only imagine it was a, a hellscape and a half, um, and they were stuck for some time, as were many people. So what had become or what had started as a community service, um, this great kind of religious um, hospitality uh, turned into an absolute debacle. And the, the newspapers got a hold of what was happening and started sharing how these people were starving. They had no shoes. Their clothes were tattered. The, the feet were frozen. They were having frostbite. It was such a tremendously bad story that they actually had to ship a good deal of them back into the cities, try and get them jobs as um, um, domestic servants. And they settled there for some time. We had Irish-speaking immigrants right on the banks of the Mississippi next to some of our sacred Native American places. And that's how it was written. Um, so uh, it remains Connemara Patch, layered with many histories right in our heart of our cities. So, Natalie, you, you alluded to the blizzard in October of 1880, I think you said. 81, yeah. 81, excuse me. And I, just for the benefit of our Irish listeners, can you tell me? Give me a sense of how cold it can get in your part of the world. Uh, well, you, unless you can do a lot of conversion, I can give you Fahrenheit. Uh, as, as I know it, and it's funny that um, Minnesota always comes back to the weather. Uh, it gets quite hot here. It's actually blisteringly gorgeous out here in September. Um, but we get a really hot, hot summer. It can be 100, 105 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. Um, you guys go ahead and do your calculations. I know that's all above 50 degrees Celsius. Um, but it can also get to an actual temperature of 50 degrees below Fahrenheit. It's the, the second largest swing, I believe, second only to Siberia. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we absolutely get here are seasons. And that's one of the things I missed most living abroad, living in Ireland, where it, it, it was so temperate. You couldn't tell one season from the next. You just get different versions of, you know, gray and or green, depending on the clouds. Um, here, the, the seasons are fierce. The, the summer is glorious. The fall, um, breathtaking. The winter, well, yeah, that'll take your breath away, too. <laughs> um, but as Scandinavians say, um, there are no bad uh, seasons or there is no bad weather. There's only bad clothing. So we know how to gear up for that. We know how to approach it. And, you know, the Irish who came here and, and looked around and thought, this is a pretty good place to be, must have agreed with me in some way, shape or form, because they really did found St. Paul. They've been a huge part of the um, 
the building of the civic structure. They became the politicians. Um, our previous mayor was uh, from an Irish family. His father had been a senator. There's so much Irish history here in this area that people forget there was actually no Irish cultural center, um, while there are many other ones. Um, there wasn't one until 12 years ago. So the Irish have always been here, but I think they started to disappear uh, into the landscape. They started to disappear into the melting pot. And so part of what we've done is actually create a place where they could come and they could gather and they could celebrate or they could mourn. And it has been, uh, if you build it, they will come. So that's, that's one of the things that's actually really changed in the landscape here. Nellie, tell us a little bit about the founding of the Celtic Junction Arts Center, uh, the dream and how much of the dream has been realized. And, and why the name Junction? Uh, why did you settle on that? Oh, well, <sighs> there wasn't, there wasn't a, a dream so much as a spark. And I think it's really important to note that the Celtic Junction really was a coming together. Um, the strengths here in Minnesota have been our rivers and our railroads. Um, and it just so happened that as my husband and I were looking for sites for the Irish Cultural Center, everywhere we looked, there happened to be a train line running. And so it became a pervasive theme. We wanted to make sure that it was where, um, like a crossroads, where, where everybody could contribute, everyone could meet, and that there wouldn't be any exclusion. So we were very much welcoming to the Scots community, the Welsh community. We've had different um, Breton things. We've had Ottawa Valley dancing. Uh, the, the importance of the junction is that it is always bringing new things together. It's, it's like that classic quote, um, no man steps in the same river twice, for it is never the same man and is never the same river. At the Celtic Junction, it really is the same thing. Um, we believe that as beautiful as the Irish arts and the Irish traditions are, that they are not meant to be put in a glass case. They're not meant to stay still. They are energy. They are moving. They are evolving. And they're coming through with people and with talent and with voices and they cross through our path and we let them cross and we let them be what they are. And sometimes they merge with something else. Um, that's actually one of the most exciting things that we do is we see how it comes together and connects with other cultures or connects with our other um, traditions, other races. That That is exactly what the energy of America is all about. Um, and then, of course, you take that primal, beautiful art of Ireland and cross it with some down home Midwest sensibility. And really what we got is this incredible um, transformation of energies where where people are here to to make art, uh, to discover themselves and to evolve with what it is. That's that's the dynamism of the idea of a junction, a place where something is coming together. And to answer the first part of your question, we never dreamt that it would be what it is today. I don't think we could have done so. And it was really, like I said, it was a spark uh, or a seed. And it's something that was not unlike yourselves, the idea of the Irish stew. I'm sure you've heard of stone soup. And somebody, you just needed somebody to come in and drop that first idea in. And maybe that idea wasn't actually anything important, but it was that stone that rippled the message across. Somebody says, you know what, I can contribute carrots or I can contribute uh, music. So you could say I could contribute potatoes. Well, that's maybe that's, there's the dance coming in. And what the community did was we made our stone suit together. And I think by being... <laughs> Someone coming from the background that I do, which is theater, which is directing, to be awake and to be sensitive to all of these amazing energies and contributions and to make, to make space for them, to mm -hmm. welcome them, to give them voice, to give them power. And what the community together has made has absolutely been transformational. I could not have imagined what it is because it's become something more than more than the sum of its parts there there must have been some times though that you were 
in the midst of things where you were scratching your head, what are we doing? You know, that sort of pushing the rock up the hill feeling. Oh, we're back to the rocks. Well, absolutely. <laughs> um, we, we acquired the building in 2009. And as you might recall, it was a, a terrible economic downturn at the time. And our very closest and most trusted friends, um, who I shall not name here tonight, um, told us, you're crazy. Don't do this. Absolutely don't do this. You'll never succeed. Um, and thank heavens we didn't listen to our closest friends. Uh, they, they still contributed. So one of <laughs> them um, came to us and said, you know, the idea of the junction and the crossroads, there's this very underutilized, beautiful, ancient Celtic symbol, and that's the, the Bridges Cross. You should use that. Um, and it's really interesting. I think that was a bit of alchemy that he provided for us because it's that same idea that each one of those strands, each one of those pieces that of reed or straw that comes together to hold the center out, hold the center in, sorry, and then these vectors that project out, it really is just just pieces of of organic material, but wrapped together, they transform into something greater. They become a, a symbol of community. They become the ancient pagan symbol, of course, meant uh, like a windmill. It was a reel of, of creation, but also destruction. It was a symbol of constant change. Uh, and I think that is that is literally one of the touchstones that we operate our organization by, that that anybody can contribute a strand or a piece and that it helps to change the vector and that we're always ready to take in the new breath of life. What's coming to us now, for example, a pandemic, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, fiscal horror, you know, all of these, these things that really look terribly frightening. And then to let that breath and let that, that catalyst come in and make something completely new you know, where we're going right now is actually far more exciting than anything that I envisioned in late 19 or 2020. Um, and part of that is, is, is holding that ideal in our hearts and in our, in our spirit and being ready for that wind change um, and transformation and, and having to, to be authentic to what's coming and, that's that's what's setting our path. I mean, it, it's not me. It's I think it's really important um, that I put it down. And say I I'm not I'm not a, a careful crafter of this world. I couldn't possibly claim that. Um, that would be a misplaced ego. Um, I'm I'm a caretaker of it mm -hmm. or a director. If you want to go back into mm -hmm. my uh, my theatrical background, all of these incredible personalities and all of these incredible. Um, pieces of art and energy are coming in and it's my job to to give them shape um, to bring them into that crossroads and to make something completely unique and more than the sum of their parts that's that's actually my job i suppose maybe i'm the alchemist i'm not mm -hmm. sure <laughs> glad you've managed to uh, redraw, uh, redraw your uh, job description but um <laughs> let me ask this question you alluded to the fact a little earlier that it felt like Irish culture was was fading a bit in Minnesota. And I'm guessing because the bulk of the immigrants probably arrived in the middle of the 19th century. So we're probably about four or five generations in uh, for most, not all, but most. Your husband obviously is an exception. Um, but I'm curious, based on your experience of living in Dublin, um, how you deal with the issue of Irish American identity, like traditionally an, an American will show up in Ireland and, and, you know, he'll say, you know, people will ask, well, where are you from? I'm from Boston. And a lot of times they'll, they'll say I'm Irish and Irish people look at them and say, no, you're not. You know? um, and, and Irish people sometimes are a bit perplexed at Americans identifying as Irish. So my question is, is A, do you identify as Irish? And B, what do you make of this almost just a certain amount of tension between the Irish of Ireland and the Irish of American in terms of identities? Well, that is quite a question. <laughs> um, I, 
I'm a classic American mutt. I don't know how else to put it. That's not delicate. Um, my background mm -hmm. uh, with my maiden name being Nugent. Um, yeah, like I said, we did um, St. Patrick's Day, corned beef and cabbage, potatoes, etc. But it was only one day a year. And yeah, you know, with some maturity uh, coming into the middle age of my life, having children, you know, we look into my history um, and find that, of course, of, of a lot more Irish, Noonan, uh, Nugent, Finnegan, Foley, uh, to find out more about the stories. This is the time in your life usually you start to discover that. But it wasn't really me. It was my daughter uh, who wanted to know, because I think having been born in Dublin, she was born in the Coombe, same hospital her, her father was born in and brought home to the same street um, that her father grew up in. And then the 2001 foot and mouth pandemic, mm -hmm. as you might recall, hit Ireland. Um, now for a brand new mother and father with a tiny little baby, a massive mortgage, a big garden and a brand, uh, brand new bathroom that we had just redesigned because I said, you know, I'm an American. I have to have a new bathroom. Um, there's one of my um, American Irish. I, I just had to have a new bathroom. Don't tell uh, me you're not a fan of Dublin plumbing. Well, it was a 1970s uh, <laughs> old porcelain toilet there. I know we're going to get this part into the... Uh, into the podcast because you know it was it was one of those housing estates um had to be changed but we we suddenly panicked you know the, the work dried up we had this little child to take care of um my parents were visiting and they left and i i'll tell you this part of the story i was i felt very romantic about my husband i felt very romantic about living in ireland and yet i was probably the loneliest I've ever been in my life when the, the time that I lived there in 2001, I think broke 40 years of records of rain, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit. And like I said, um, I had this tiny baby I was taking care of and I found it very hard. It was very hard to be there unless you knew certain people, you know, I wanted to get some work and most of our friends were still, you know, touring the world and, we just, I didn't have the same kind of network there. And I did, I did find that very hard. And when the pandemic came, my husband turned to me and he looked, he says, you know what I think you need? I think you need a taste of home. And I said, you know, I, we've, we've brought everything American that we can into our, our be beautiful home. We had a beautiful home in uh, Blanchardstown. And he said, no, I don't mean bringing home into here. I mean, bringing you home. Do you want to go home to America for a while? And it was one of these things that really caught me um, to where I couldn't even breathe. I could hardly speak. I couldn't have named that myself. Um, that as, as beautiful an experience as it was, you know, working with Riverdance and living abroad, um, which I had done a lot of, I'd lived all over the world, that yes, I wanted to be home. Um, and he had to see it for me. And that's one of the kindest and most lovely things that he's ever done for me in my life is to, to recognize what I couldn't. So to come home to St. Paul and then think, okay, you know, we're starting all over. We only rented our house. Nothing was permanent. Um, we didn't, we didn't sell our home in Ireland for about three years after, but as we started to look around, he said, well, you know, how were we going to bring the Irish culture then back into our family's lives, back into our children's lives? And the Celtic Junction is part of how we answered that. So it was, it was drawing home into us because we, we had to do it on one side of the world. Um, and then as an expat, ex expat, now we had to draw it into the other side. And my daughter is the one that has really researched her genealogy. She's the one that says, you know, I want to know more about my history. Um, as we built the center, um, and it's not just her, it's a lot of the young people. I, we're absolutely teeming with young people at the Celtic Junction. It's phenomenal. Um, they, even if they don't care about Ireland, they're like, we want to know more about this, this tune. We want to know more about this dance. You know, tell us about this history. We have young people coming to do their projects um, for State History Day on Irish topics. Um, one of our favorites, of course, Grace O'Malley. There's so many ways to engage and to draw into it that... I suppose my identity with Ireland has only come 
through helping others find it. Mm-hmm. And that that's something that I can do as, as an American of a, a mixed Scandinavian Irish background. I can take all the the, the fanciful, artistic, creative uh, writing side that I, I have somewhere in that Noonan, Nugent, Finnegan, Foley blood, and then put it with the very practical, where I, you know, we've created a home, we've created a place that's welcoming, we've created um, something where concerts start on time. Haha, <laughs> believe it or not, there's my Scandinavian input. Um, I, I'm a good organizer and I can, I can get things not just imagined. Uh, but I can get things done. And we have we have drawn in this amazing collection of people around at the Celtic Junction who are our catalysts to their own art. I don't have to be an expert in anything. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I just have to be a good organizer because we have this incredible person who is our librarian. Um, who researches the the lumberjack camps and you know can, has these CDs of songs you can you can find them they're they're phenomenal. Um, we have a PhD who's running our um, Irish College of Minnesota program. Now we've modeled it after the idea of the ancient Irish colleges of Europe, um, the ones that you mentioned just at the top of the broadcast in Paris and in um, and in Prague and Rome. That's the idea is that we're keeping people, you know, really uh, researching and exploring the depth of what does it mean to be Irish? What does Ireland hold for you? And the amazing thing is not everybody who wants to know is Irish. Very true, Natalie. Uh, Talking to the head of the Irish Repertory Theater, and he said if it wasn't for uh, Jewish patrons, the theater still wouldn't be going. You know, the culture, the culture reaches across. Uh, And we talked to another person who's an actor, producer, voiceover artist, and she she used the term culture makers to describe not just the person who's on the stage singing or the actor, but all of the all of the people who are the culture makers who are make who are making these things happen, the collaboration and the, the many, many talents. And it sounds like you're really pulling them all together in St. Paul. Well, you know, I think it's really important, uh, particularly for your podcast to know that uh, I've been teaching Irish dance now for almost 17 years. And I would say maybe 10, 15 percent of the kids that we have, have any Irish connection at all. We teach um, children who are Hispanic. We have a a fair Hispanic population in the area that we're in, uh, African-American, as we've had Eastern Indian students. We've had families that have come even from Croatia and Russia. And for some reason, they come and they find us and they say, we like what you do. We like what you do here. We want our children to be a part of this. There's always been an incredible connection in the music, as you know. You know, if we go back to Riverdance, what Bill Whelan did with the music and the crossover, it was really born out of so much of the work that he had done before, exploring um, Irish music fused with other cultural influences. Uh, And that's something that is happening every day. Um, There's, of course, incredible Scandinavian influence um, in, for example, the, the fiddle, fiddling tradition, um, you could go into the step dancing, you know, whether it's Cape Britain or Ottawa Valley, and see how things came over to a new world. And absolutely, they became reinvented um, in incredible and new dynamic ways. Uh, I can't wait to see, you know, this hugely dynamic um, group of young people that we have had and raised and taught are the people who are now out going into the world, um, they're starting bands, they're at universities, they're um, doing their singing or harp careers. They are out making what Irish music and Irish art and Irish culture are going to be for the future. And they're doing it with people of every creed and color, um, which is a huge part of what what we are and what we do. And it's, uh, somebody had put it to me, um, my dear friend Maeve, that you don't have to be Italian to eat pasta. <laughs> you know, why, why should you ever have to be Irish to come in and do Irish dance or music or enjoy, you know, the the wisdom of Shaw or the the genius of Joyce? Um, you don't. 
You don't. It's a, it's one of those things that I suppose what I respond to and, and to go back to my own Irish identity, what I'm really respond to is is not a genealogical root so much as it is a, a primal root, a primal root of being human. The Irish traditions, I think, have something very special in them that they are primal. They they touch something um, deep that that cuts across boundaries, that cuts across cultures, that cuts across generations, and that people can respond to in their own unique way. And because it's authentic, you know, and it, it doesn't become that capital H heritage. You know, there's so many um, places that it's heritage. And I see that I, that H is this big box <laughs> kind of trapping and dividing and, and putting things in, um, you know, back to the idea of the Bridget's Cross at the junction of things that, that continually change and ebb and flow. And the people doing that, that is what's going to keep this culture alive. It's what's going to bring it into and lead the 21st century. I can't help but think of Ireland, you know, right now sitting on the National Security Council, um, Ireland and their um, 2025, their diaspora um, program that they're doing, which is absolutely one of the things that is here supporting us out in Minnesota is the Department of Foreign Affairs Immigrant Support Program. And the idea of, of these Irish people from all over the place, whether you're literally, you know, off the old sod, as they would say, or if you're many generations past, or if you just have this passion and affinity for it, they are tapping into that energy. And it was very foresightful. I think it's going to change um, the effect this little tiny Ireland has on the global population. It's going to be incredibly impactful. Um, and they're using us and centers like us to to help make that work, to make that experience something unique that people can tap into in their own way. And maybe they just come and listen to a concert and drink beer. You know, one of the gorgeous things about um, Irish tradition is it's welcoming and the, the bar is very low. You know, we, you don't have to um, say, you know, re recite a piece of um, the Isle of Inish free for me there, John. And if you can't do that, you know, you can't be Irish or, you know, Martin, can you, can you speak, you know, Asquelga? Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, you, there's no, there's no energy of restriction. There aren't boundaries that are being put up. The boundaries are being torn down. And that is what's going to move Ireland and her people, her diaspora and everybody who loves it into the 21st century and beyond. You brought up a good word there. I, I was hoping to bring up the affinity Irish. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that's a pillar of the Irish diaspora policy is to connect with those people who, for whatever reason, identify with some aspect of Ireland, even though genealogically they don't relate to Ireland. And and that's part of the conversation we're trying to have here on Irish Stew, uh, you know, different ways, different new ways of looking at a global Irish identity. And I just add on top of that, um, what I think um, is important about what you were saying there and I think it really played out in on steroids in the case of river dance. If you think about it, the two primary dancers in 1994 were Gene Butler from New York and Michael Flatley from Chicago. Okay, two Americans. Okay, of Irish extraction, uh, but they infused Irish dance with something totally new. Uh, as, as it was remarked, I think. Shortly after that performance, they put the sex back in Irish dancing. It had gone from this kind of very stiff and rigid discipline into a whole new art form. And so having those conversations, those cross fertilizations, you know, some we send out from Ireland and they stay like I do. And uh, some stay many generations. But boomeranging back, I believe really makes, you know, the island stronger, but also, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, Irish soft power, uh, meaning, you know, increasing that kind of cultural footprint so people pay attention when the leaders of this very small island start talking. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, I can see totally how uh, your artist art center fits in very well with that. Uh, I'm not sure how well that's really understood in the island 
of Ireland itself outside the diplomatic uh, core. So I'm, I'm curious, do you have any views on that? Well, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It's It's been a very interesting five years. So part of what, um, with the, the, the government um, diaspora policy, has come a connection with the consulates uh, and they really are using them to reach out to us. I don't think, um, well, I know we wouldn't be where we are if it weren't for the support um, that we've had of, I think we're on our, our, perhaps our fifth consul general. They've had a lot of turnover there, but every single one of them has come in and actually said part of our game plan is to connect with you, find out what are you doing what's working, um, and how can we support you? Another thing that they've started is a a regional conversation. So we meet regularly, um, at least once a year. Last year was tricky, but we still met via Zoom to have a conversation with um, like-minded folks. So there's associations of a lot of things. There's associations of Irish studies programs. There's associations of festivals, but there are no associations of Irish cultural centers. The only way those conversations for um, what's working, what's not, how could we work together, best practice, collaboration, partnership has really been led um, by the consulates. And I'm not sure whose idea it was, but I think it's, um, it's, it's working. Uh, You know, they're, they're using and supporting us, which uh, increases our programming. It increases our profile. It draws new audiences in. And then in, in turn, as these new audiences are exposed to this incredible culture and this incredible history and tradition, they go ahead and they make it their own. And it all feeds back. If you think about it, it's actually very subversive governmentally. Um, there's a great song. I'm trying to think of uh, what a, which song it was. My daughter would kill me for this. I <laughs> should shout it through the door at some point. But there's a song that talks about the Irish, the wildflowers that grow. And you might try and pluck them, but they only come back stronger. And not just pluck them, remove them from their land and cast them aside off into America. And not only did they um, survive but they took root, they took seed, and it grew. And so what what Irish culture really is, it's those little wildflowers. America was this incredible fertile soil for everything Irish um, to come and be be what it wasn't allowed to be um, for so many years back on on, on that island. And I hope there isn't ever um, too much us and them. I think... I think that, you know, it's our job right now to be global citizens and to recognize that we are all connected. Um, Everything that we do, everything that we choose to do affects other people. Um, What we choose to do as groups of people affects groups of people. And of course, what countries choose to do, you know, you, you see what's happening there. And Ireland is growing to the point where it has, um, a far larger influence than perhaps its square footage would ever intimate. Um, And it's because there's been this this energy, I think, held in there for such a long time, the Irish writing tradition, the storytelling, you know, feeling how the tunes are plucked out of midair, that gorgeous rhythm that you hear pounded in the feet of river dance. And it has literally been let loose. And it's gone to seed and it's everywhere Um, and it's growing and it's changing. And the fact that that always reflects back to this beautiful little island of green. Um, I hope that the people of Ireland remain um, proud of what their roots have done and never, um, you know, the the haves or the have nots Um, as it transforms. Now, there's always going to be different points of view. There's always going to be conflicting um, stories, but at their core, everybody's story is a human story. And I think the Irish experience shows that better than any other, um, that despite colonization, um, despite destruction of the language, despite attempted genocide, uh, if I may use that word, um, I'm right now even thinking the the tomb, the reports that have come about the babies in tomb, 
And then looking at the indigenous First Nation cultures here in America and the the graves of children at all of these indigenous schools um, where these people, you know, it's it's that that energy of trying to crush or change or alter a people in order to gain this upper ground. Um, what Ireland has been through is what has actually allowed it to speak to the world. Um, we can't hold, we can't hold just, you know, black and white. The, the idea of, of Ireland's struggles and of Ireland's suffering um, has actually allowed it, I think, to birth something very unique in this world, something very powerful, um, because it's, it's that story that touches um, so deeply into the root of the human experience. And that's, that's our job right now. That's my job is to, to, to reach down deep into those roots and to help people think globally, to help people um, act and, and live authentically. And that's what people respond to uh, in this, this gorgeous community that we've got. And it's, it's so exciting um, that I suppose, you know, to, to wrap up my idea of the, the Irish identity that I have, um, it doesn't come, it doesn't come lightly, um, but it actually doesn't come genealogically. Like I said, it actually, it comes because I feel like it picked me mm. uh, to, to help it grow and to help it change. And, and, and I'm a willing uh, servant. I don't know what else I can say because it feeds me back as do the people. Um, this community is really worth working hard for and together who knows what we can transform. That's a beautiful, Natalie. Uh, I want to just take things up to the contemporary times before we let you go. You've been very generous with your time here and your insights. Uh, you talked about the hoof and mouth um, uh, pandemic, which I'm sure is not a familiar thing to a lot of our listeners, but there certainly has been another pandemic, and you talked about global connectivity. Maybe it's not such a good thing when we when we see the spread of COVID. Clearly, a challenge for you and your organization. What was your lessons learned, and, and how did you cope? Well, um, you know, first, like everybody else, I think you know there was a little panic. Um, I, if I if I said otherwise, I'd be lying. So I'll be I'll be truthful. Um, I can't say I didn't enjoy. Um, only a week, um, you know, or two of, of quiet. And then really, you know, the, the penny dropping to say, this is something that we're, we're going to have to work through. Um, we just moved very quickly into, um, the technological world. We, we didn't just do zoom. We didn't just, um, put, you know, content online. We actually established, a, a full-scale production company. We invested in Blackmagic cinema cameras, um, the right kind of tripods. We transformed what was our event space into a production studio. Um, we started connecting with our different local organizations. So um, we have, we're actually a collective of nonprofits. The, the dance school is there, the Irish Fair Minnesota, our festival. Center for Irish Music is the music school, which I helped to found, but I, I absolutely cannot take um, any any more credit for that. It's it's blossomed on its own. And then um, Irish Music and Dance Association, we actually turned to our community and said, well, here's what we have. How can we how can we help? Um, and so we started supporting local artists first and foremost, and we produced live concerts and sent them out all over the world with a donation button, with the PayPal donation. You know, the first idea is who, who are the people that don't have the, the safety nets? I mean, right now, a lot of them, um, whether people would like to believe it or not, it's our artists. So that's where we started. Um, we get, began to produce. We did a full-scale show, put that out. Um, we, we put that work into service best we could. And then as soon as the decent weather hit, because, um, of course, you know, we're talking about Minnesota. We're back to the weather. Uh, in April, we actually built an outdoor stage. Um, right when everybody was was yearning 
to be together and to have a hug and to see a, a full face, you know, without a mask for even just a few minutes safely. Um, ours is a very cautious community. Um, we built an outdoor stage and the first night that we had out, it didn't have to be the most incredible um, world-class musicians in the world. It didn't have to be, you know, watching something at, you know, Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center. It wasn't necessarily something from the Abbey Theater. You know, we didn't need anything high, you know, flute. And what people wanted to do was, was come together and to, to speak and to see and to be in that energy again. Um, and what it was is, you know, we talked about right at the very beginning, how everything that happens really at the Celtic Junction, it, it just came from kind of a spark of an idea that's been fed and supported and grown. And that was just like, pulling all those embers together. And it was, the, I swear, it was the first time we felt warm in months. And that's, I think, one of the best things we did. We let people be together again. We let people, you know, feel safe again. Um, I'll never forget that the first time somebody, you know, that wasn't an immediate family member wrapped their arms around me. And, uh, and it just like, wow. This, this is what we're doing all of this for, you know, we're through it. You know, right now, um, because we've got the Delta variant, the move uh, variant, sorry, um, we're very aware uh, that we're learning to live with this. Um, so what I'm doing right now as a community is I'm sourcing and sponsoring uh, the Midwest um, government program to help do weekly COVID testing so that not only can people be vaccinated, we can actually on-site test and support our community so we can continue to come together, to continue to make music, to continue to dance and to gather safely. We're, we, haven't, we have never taken the masks off within our building. Um, like I said, uh, we have so many precious people and some of them uh, immunocompromised, some of them quite elderly and loads and loads of kids I don't teach a single child that's over the age of 12. I spend every week of, um, or four times a week, um, all year long, I've spent with unvaccinated children. Um, and I will continue to do so because I know we can do it safely. And by gosh, those kids really need to get out of their house and to have a safe place to go. So um, that's what we've turned our energies to. Um, and I'm still working on it. Uh, there might be some other elements we bring in, but that at the moment, it seems to be kind of that um, the example that uh, places like you know New York and Washington and um, these these large metropolitan centers are are giving us, and so I can take that and I can provide that right here in the heart of St. Paul, um, so that we can actually live with this thing and keep living. So um, I think. Uh what you're really expressing is the importance of building community. And um, I think if you look at, as you said, at, at your root, that is ultimately what makes humans happy. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful message that needs to be reinforced consistently. People can get distracted by bright, shiny bowels, but if you don't have a hug, if you don't have a shared space to talk and exchange ideas, life isn't any way as rich as it can be, you know? Uh, and so that's, to me, that's why your institution is incredibly valuable. But uh, we kind of got into the part of the show where we ask our guest, uh, we call it the shameless plug moment. Uh, I love that. <laughs> So, and that's meant to be, if, if there's something that you want to tell people about or a cause that you want to espouse. So what is your shameless plug, Natalie? Well, it's so hard. I could actually say, go support artists, um, take our classes. They're available online, 18 classes about the most incredible, you know, dynamic parts of Irish language and, and history and literature. But I think what, what I would leave with is what's, what's made our community and what's made our center thrive is to connect, you know, to go out and find what connects you to people and not just the people that you know, but find out what connects you to something you don't understand. Um, because that connection, that human 
understanding is the only way that we are going to evolve and thrive. And that's, that's what we're doing. That's my shameless plug. I'm very altruistic. No, take everything the junction has to offer, but yeah, I, 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 I'll ideally, um, we keep making connections and there's, there's just really no limit to our, our power and as humans to transform our world. And we need it on every level. And if listening to our concerts, for example, that will be live streaming again, you know, helps you to understand, you know, your own culture or, or to pick up an instrument and really spend a little bit of soulful time learning something, or perhaps the language classes, the most beautiful words that are in Irish have so many meanings. Take some time and go and learn those meanings because until we understand what is outside of us, I think we can't understand ourselves. So that's, that's my shameless plug. Dig deep. I, I, I want to add though, because my, my business is public relations. So I want to help you close here, Natalie, by saying Celtic, junction.org you will be so amazed i i kept looking at the website took a quick glance okay i've got this place figured out wait a minute what does this tab take me oh my god they do this too what does this tab take me? How, no, how can they even be doing this as well there's education there's photography there's film there's irish music there's scottish music there's latvian music so i really recommend people go to celticjunction.org and that's my shameless plug for you natalie Thank you, John. And I'll just add on top of that, we need to throw a little Irishism in. I think we can say about Natalie Toshiar Winnemwick, or she's on the pig's back. Thank you so much, Martin. Well, Martin, what did you think of our first trip out to St. Paul, Minnesota, and our visit with Natalie Nugent O'Shea. Yeah, I was glad to break out of the traditional perception of Irish America and the cities of the Midwest and the Northeast, New York, Chicago, for example. A lot of Irish people may not be that familiar with Minnesota, but it has this rich Irish tradition that a lot of people don't know about. It's something like uh, 10% of the overall population there. And what's also interesting is it's basically the same size population as our own. It's about 5.8 5.8 million people. But one of the things that occurred to me uh, when I was listening to Natalie talk about her experience is the word ricochet was popping into my mind. She started off without any particularly strong feelings for Ireland beyond the corned beef and cabbage version of Irishness that a lot of times is expressed into America, to getting involved in this kind of seminal cultural event that was river dance ultimately leading her to Dublin and an Irish husband and then being lonesome for home. And to some degree, she found her own home by going to Ireland. But when she came back to Minnesota, she brought Ireland back and now makes her life out of things Irish. Yeah, there's a lot of back and forth, ebb and flow of uh, Irish culture and Irish discovery and uh, like emerging Irish identity being associated with river dance, which is a melting pot to a certain extent of traditions going in to create this new form of Irish dance. That experience of an American living in Ireland, we hear about the Irish person living in America a lot on this program and the sort of dislocation that she began to feel, even though she loved the experience in many ways and how home was back where she started and she never thought she'd be in St. Paul. And then the discovery of what was Irish about St. Paul. I mean, that story of the Connemara patch I thought was fascinating and how her organization, the Celtic Junction Art Center, has helped uh, promote these stories and bring them out and has found the musicians and is tied up with other cultures to create some nice cross-cultural experiences. I had three words. Well, I got two and a half words that I thought of. First is passion. Not, not a word I throw around too lightly, but I think, Martin, you felt the passion coming across of how she looks at her mission and this organization. And going along with that was commitment. The last word I had trouble with because I think of, is it creativity? Is it innovation? Is it opportunistic? And what I mean is she adapted to what was coming her way. She saw opportunities and seized them. I'm sure there's something of a plan, but it sounds like many things they were able to do, just take advantage of the situation, 
find new paths forward. Very, very impressive organization that uh, she started. Yeah, John, it's interesting that they use the St. Bridget's Cross as part of their iconography because it's kind of symbolic of their weaving of things together, taking all these various threads, be it the Irish college that they run there with Irish languages or the dance or the music, but pulling all those things together. And one word that comes to me was the word conductor. Mm. Uh, I think Natalie, she's obviously bringing that organizational chops to the experience, pulling people together, giving a little guidance, but also has enough humility to stand back and let things grow organically. And she's doing an awful lot of things right. You know, that connector idea reminds me of uh, Emer Rock, the diplomat we talked to in our last season, who talked about the convener, the convening mm-hmm. power of, of the diplomatic corps. Well, I, I'll, I'll wrap up with one thing that Natalie said during our conversation. Every story is a human story. And Natalie told a great story. Amen. Well, Martin, a lot of our listeners ask uh, how they can help spread the global Irish conversation. What do you think? Best thing people can do to help out the podcast is to simply share the episode. If you like what you've heard so far in this episode or other episodes, share it on social media, whether that's Facebook or whether that's Twitter or whether that's Instagram or share it via email or word of mouth. All of those things are going to help us out. And don't be shy about dropping us a note. Uh, You can do so on our website. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahill O'Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com